Hello. Um, I would like to take you on this journey that I went through to understand a little bit more about the Meteor dependency structure, particularly for the front end. Um, but uh, yeah, let me show you a little bit about that. And here's an example. I don't know if you've looked at the Meteor source code. Um, but in the Meteor project, you do a git clone of the Meteor repo. And in its packages directory, you'll see these uh, local packages. And they have their own source code and test code. And then they have this package.js that tie it all together. So um, every single Meteor package declares which other packages it uses um, as such. And I got the idea to explore this from a blog post on Crater by Manuel Scherbel, where he posted his graph of the Meteor UI subsystem. And I thought it was wonderful, and I said, you know, how'd you do this? Was it in an automated manner? Um, or did you, you know, inspect the files yourself and draw them? And um, I got so curious that I couldn't wait for an answer. And, uh, and I went and, and did some uh, hacking of my own. So you can think about the hack job involved because in contrast to something like a package JSON that's just a single JavaScript object, this actually has dynamic behavior. You know, and I, you can't really use regexes to get at it because if these sections were reordered, they would do the same thing. So really, the only way to know who uses what is to listen at, uh, is to run this code and listen for these api.use methods. So, um, like I said, I had a little time uh, to do that, and what I came up with produced graphs like this. So um, this is my version of Manuel Scherbel's graph of the UI subsystem of Meteor, and I'm using a tool to process the JSON called Dependito, which is a project that I maintain. And uh, I can also use another tool that I'll show you in a second called Madge to generate images of a different type. But here is the version that Dependito creates. And it was interesting that I noticed in Manuel's graph that space bars had no incoming arrows whatsoever. It was since a top level, top of the food chain. So in, uh, in my version of the graph, I also put space bars at the top. And uh, however, this um, you know, doesn't use a kind of two-dimensional layout. It's really more networky. It's called a force-directed graph. And it lays itself out according to certain rules, which uh, aim to minimize uh, distance between nodes and, as a consequence, minimize lines crossing. So you know, very common that you get line crossings, but if you can display a graph without them, I think that sometimes shows information uh, a little bit differently, lets you see neighborhoods. So, um, so that's what Dependito produced. And uh, I said, well, let's feed the same information into uh, our other image um, rendering tool for dependency graphs and called Madge. And now Madge's design principle is to put things on physical levels, right, in terms of a count and uh, distance from, you know, the, the top, essentially. And um, so this is the Madge version of the Meteor graph. And uh, there you see things that are, like, literally at the bottom, JSON and Base64. And uh, Tracker, again, highly depended on. And... Uh, you know, this graph doesn't make any, uh, you know, effort to avoid line crossings and, um, you know, but it, it conveys other useful information. So with these two graphs, and I'm going to look at uh, the Dependito graph, for now, um, I was like, well, what, what can this tell you? Well, one of the things that this told me was that, um, you know, in Manuel's graph, this depths library... Uh, it's now known as the tracker library. So the time that he run this, ran this, you don't see the word tracker on here. So fast forward to when I ran it, and tracker is in fact what most of the libraries that depend on it point to, except for one guy, HTMLJS, he points to depths. And I said, well, what's, what's in depths uh, these days? 
because I thought it was pretty much deprecated. And uh, it says deprecated, and then it says just use tracker. So I was able to understand that uh, that HTML.js is still depending on the shim of deps, and uh, then deps pulls in tracker. And so I actually submitted a pull request based on the information I was able to glean um, and said, hey, in my pull request, HTML.js is going to point to tracker. Any objections? So we'll see what they say about that. But that was one piece of information I was able to, to gather um, based on looking at this graph. And it also raised a question because in another episode I'll post in the show notes, I extracted a tracker into its own standalone JavaScript library. And when I did that, I do recall that I had to take eJSON and Base64 along for the ride, or I would get um, undefined errors in JavaScript. So I'm not exactly sure why I can't see that dependency. Um, if you have an explanation for that, I'd love to hear it. Um, yeah, so basically that's um, the uh, consequence of the analysis. How did I do the analysis? Well, I'll make a gist of this. It's not quite ready for prime time yet. But um, what we have is a library called well, in my Dep and Detail library, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm working on including support for spidering a meteor graph. And in order to spider the meteor graph, um, I basically have a script um, that loads up a, a library called Extract Meteor Depths. And then that gives me access to a Get Package Depths uh, function. And then I'll run that for everything in Meteor's packages folder. And all the magic is going to take place in this get package depths function. But its job is to build up an object that has all this information. So let's look at extract Meteor depths. OK, so first let me draw your attention here. Um, you saw that package api.use. I decided that I would build up this DSL until it could load every single package JS file in the Meteor distribution. So, you know, it was obvious from one of them, say uh, this one, that we need use and imply and export, but um, use is actually defined later, but imply and export, but a different one had an add files method. So I needed to mock out all of those. And the use function is the, is the fancy one that gets set up here. I'll come back to that in a second. So basically, um, I needed to declare these top level constants so that when I call get package depths, it uh, prepares the override for api.use, right? It, this is uh, preparing um, the override. And then it is going to load the uh, file if it exists using require. So when it says require that path, um, it's going to be using the objects that I defined. And the way I defined them was here to keep track uh, cumulatively of each dependency by pushing it into uh, a big global depths by package, which then you'll see that depths by package gets um, exported. And so in, when it's built up internally in the library, um, we get access to it, and, uh, and then we can spit that out on the console. So without showing you exactly how I did it, those were the major steps involved. And I'll, I'll make this code into a gist. Um, but anyway, thank you, Manuel, for a really cool post and for the other work you, you've done in the Meteor community. I use the Cheerio library and your blog on doing CSS the less way. Um, was was just great. I just saved it as a bookmark and come back to it like all the time. So anyway, hope that was a fun tour on Meteor's dependencies and I'll talk to you next week.